Okay, we are live. So I'd like to call the Comox Valley Regional District regular board meeting of Tuesday, December 6th to order. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. And as part of our commitment to reconciliation, we continue to educate ourselves on the contents of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada Calls to Action report. Today we have call to action number 14, language and culture. We call upon the federal government to enact an Aboriginal Languages Act that incorporates the following principles. One, Aboriginal languages are a fundamental and valued element of Canadian culture and society, and there is an urgency to preserve them. Two, Aboriginal language rights are reinforced by the treaties. Three, the federal government has a responsibility to provide sufficient funds for Aboriginal language revitalization and preservation. Four, the preservation, revitalization, and strengthening of Aboriginal languages and cultures are best managed by Aboriginal people and communities. And five, funding for Aboriginal language initiatives must reflect the diversity of Aboriginal languages. I would also like to recognize that today, December 6th, is a National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. So please take some time today to think about gender-based violence, the harm that it does, and how we can do better as a society. With that, we'll move to um, our in-camera motion where we will go in camera after the regular meeting according to the Community Charter Section 91A. Grant and Morin, thank you. All in favor? Thank you. And we have adoption of minutes and the first minutes are from November 15th regular meeting. Grant and McCollum, thank you. Any discussion on those minutes? All in favor of adoption? Any opposed? That's carried. And we have the November 22nd minutes. Second. Grant and Grieve, thank you. Any discussion? Okay, on adoption, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried, thank you. We move on to reports. We have the audit service plan for the year ending December 31st, 2022. Hillian and McCollum, thank you, and I'll pass it to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors, and Katie Powell, Manager of Financial Operations, is here to introduce this report, as well as your auditor, who is online. Hello, Corey. Oh. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, and good afternoon through the chair to the directors. My name is Katie Powell. I'm manager of financial operations here at the CVRD. The audit service plan for the year ended December 31st, 2022 is being provided to the board today for information. The plan and engagement letter have been prepared by MNP, the regional district's external auditor. The financial statement audit is an annual process, so review of the audit service plan may be familiar to some members of the board. Professional standards require the auditor to communicate with those charged with governance, and the board exercises its independent authority related to the external audit by meeting with the auditor to review the annual audit service plan. The board is free to ask any questions of the auditor during this process. We are anticipating that MMP will present the audit findings report to the board in May of 2023, which is also aligned with the timing of the presentation of the financial statements. Corey Vanderhorst, the audit partner from MMP, is here today via Zoom to provide an overview of the audit service plan and answer any questions that you might have. So I will pass things off to Corey. Thank you, Katie. Uh, good afternoon to the chair and, and the rest of the board. Thank you for having me here today. Um, you've got the audit service plan uh, in your digital package. I, I won't go through it line by line. It's exciting reading, but uh, I wanted to have an opportunity to talk to you today on a couple of highlights um, and then to answer any questions uh, if you have them. So uh, as, as Katie mentioned, uh, that's, that's a great summary, a reminder that um, you know our role as auditor is to Get the financial statements that are prepared by staff, uh, look at them and, and get comfort over them, the fact that the financial statements are, are uh, presented appropriately. 
uh, and correctly in accordance with the correct accounting standards. So that's public sector accounting standards um, for all local governments. Um, there's a few important things as we're doing our audit uh, to note. One in the audit service plan is uh, the concept of materiality. So this is a, a number that auditors use to drive the amount of testing that we do. If we find an item that we disagree with staff on, it's a threshold where I can give you a clean audit opinion or, or I have to make a comment. So that number for the regional district, we are planning to use uh, $2.9 million uh, for the 2022 audit. That's a calculation, roughly three to 4% of your annual revenues. That's how we calculate that number. Um, so it's an important one to know about. If the uh, that's based on planned revenues for 2022, if when we uh, come in in the spring, your actual revenues are different than planned, uh, we'll revisit that number and, and talk to staff and, and get agreement that we are using the appropriate amount. Uh, we've already been in to do what we call our interim testing, uh, in uh, where we look at the controls. Uh, at the Reason District to make sure you're getting accurate financial reporting and that you're safeguarding assets and managing risk appropriately. Uh, and we will be back in late March to do the, the year-end work. One item that is important to note, um, we do have a scope change in the audit this year. There's a new audit standard set by the, the standard setters in Toronto, um, requiring us to do additional work around internal control processes, around IT systems and the software that's being used at the regional district. Uh, and it also requires us to reassess um, our audit risk uh, on a line by line basis on the financial statements uh, and analyze and make sure that we're covering off any risks, new risks that are identified by increasing our, our level of knowledge. So that change is noted uh, both in, in the staff, uh, staff report that's at the top of the audit service plan and in the audit service plan on page six or seven there, um, where we do anticipate an additional amount of fees. Um, and so we've identified that there because that's an unusual item for this year. Uh, I'll pause there. I'm happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Any questions from the board? I don't see any, so you can continue, Corey, thanks. Okay, thank you. That's everything for me. Okay, I actually do have some questions sort of around the new reporting standards. Um, yeah. Just wondering where the um, the IT risk is coming from. Is that, you know, that they has um, the government been seeing other um, regions uh, having, I don't know, compromised um, uh, information systems or, or where is that um, coming from? Thank you, Manager. That's a great question. So the... Stepping out of what's actually in the standard there, the logic uh, and the thought process behind spending more time looking at, at the, the software and the IT is there, there have been some very large failures in the, in the corporate sector in the UK in particular. Um, and the idea is that if there's a piece of software or technology and that's the only source of information, there's no paper-based information going into the software or there's no reports coming out of it, everything's in the software. But when you think of cloud-based registration systems, uh, online shopping systems, things like that, um, the standard setters have looked at that and said, the auditor needs to get a better comfort on that information that's all digital, that there is no other source of information, everything's digital. Um, so we look at it from two perspectives when we do our, our audit work this year. One, we're looking at software that would be standard or, or we would call it kind of off the shelf. Everybody's using it. It's not customized for the regional district. And that's a lower risk piece of software because you don't have access to the code behind it. And then we would look at the other one, which would be if the regional district has hired a, 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 you know, a company to build a, a custom piece of software and either the contractor or the regional district itself has access to the code, what our risk around that software then increases because either you or the contractor can change things in the code and we can't rely on the reports coming out of it necessarily without getting comfort that the software is processing things properly. So at the highest level, it's coming out of some, some bankruptcies and failures uh, in Europe and the UK um, and then filtering down to all the audits in Canada with this idea that we need to be really comfortable on technology in the IT and the risk that it could be manipulated. 
That makes sense. Thank you. I also had a question about the um, new asset retirement obligations, particularly around the landfill closures. And I guess it's a little bit to staff. It's, um, this is obviously something that we're already um, monitoring and, and putting uh, um, reserves away for. Um, so is it just a matter of um, reporting what we're doing or is there additional reporting that will need to happen through this? Great, thank you again for the question. Maybe I'll start and then and then let staff uh, add on. So the, the landfill is a really important piece of uh, your estimated liabilities, a really big one, um, as you're looking at what is it gonna cost to close phases, monitor. The, there is, if you looked at your financial statements from last year, there is already a, a landfill liability on the books. Um, it has been on for years. The new ARO section changes how you report that liability you're actually going to have a, an asset accounted for it as well, um, offsetting the liability. So it's a little bit of a different look um, from how you would have seen it in the past, a little bit of a tweak in how it's calculated. So the number of the liability will change, um, but it is something that you had been tracking in the past, accounting for it, um, and will continue to account uh, as you go forward. Um, and that will, that change will show up in 2023 and, and beyond. Okay, I think that was sufficient explanation. <laughs> Sorry, I do have one more. Um, so on page 13, there's um, the overall reliance. Oops, sorry, I just lost it. Um, but it had a sort of low control. Um, and I was wondering, I wasn't quite sure about that rating. Is it a good rating or a bad rating? <laughs> Sure. Thank you. No, that is a great question as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the low reliance there um, is a, a function of our risk assessments at the region district. Uh, so there's there's three things we can do with controls. We can test that, or we can um, get an understanding of how they're designed. So are they managing risks properly? We can look at how they're implemented. And, and so those two things, the design and implementation, we do every year. So that, that we get uh, documentation, we're talking with Katie and Lucy and, and the, the rest of the finance team. How are you covering risks? Uh, how are you making sure you get accurate financial information that, that bank accounts and other assets are safeguarded? And then the third thing we can do with controls is we can actually test whether they are working effectively. Now, we don't plan to do that at the Reasons District um, because of how we assess risk on all of the accounts that you have there. We're basically saying our most efficient audit approach is not to test the efficiency of the controls. So it actually is not a comment on the reason districts controls and whether they're working or not. It's more a comment of how do we get the most efficient audit, keep your costs down as much as we can, um, but still get enough comfort over the year-end balances and the revenues and expenses um, that are in your financial statements. So that's our judgment call on the low or the uh, low reliance that you've identified there. Um, and it's not uncommon uh, for municipalities who have large finance teams, lots of controls, lots of policies, uh, lots of built up history of, of really strong um, overall env control environment um, and healthy report, financial reporting that we go this route where we can just look at the year end balances and as well as look at how the controls are designed and implemented, but not necessarily test the effectiveness. So that is an explanation of why we're calling it low reliance, because we're not going to test if the controls are effective uh, for the year. Right. So it's just a comment on the audit process itself and yeah. not saying that there's insufficient controls here at the regional district. <laughs> okay, great. That gives me comfort. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I don't see any further questions and we're on receipt of the report. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. So thank you very much. Everyone. We'll see you again soon. <laughs> okay, so next we have the orientation on procurement and financial planning. Second. Grant and Morin, thank you. Thank you, Chair and Directors. And we have a few items of orientation for you tonight. The first is a dual presentation by Kevin Duval 
and Karen Garrett. Um, they will first go through the financial planning uh, processes uh, that we have in place here and then deal with procurement. So we'll start off with Kevin and then Karen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Russell. Through the chair to the directors, good afternoon. So yes, as Russell alluded to, Karen and I are here today to provide you a bit of information about what we do in financial services. So I'll be kicking it off with providing just a quick overview of our, our financial planning branch, uh, or sorry, financial services branch, and then I'll be jumping straight into financial planning and how the process works, particularly for the new directors, and also just to give you a sense of kind of the various activities that we kind of undertake as part of that process. So as you can see here, financial services branch, um, you know, kind of is, is, is kind of uh, overseen by our, our new CFO, Lucy Wachorek. And then of course, underneath that, there are three kind of uh, distinct departments within financial services. First being financial planning, which is uh, overseen by myself. And then Karen, who will be speaking to procurement services, looks after that piece. And then Katie uh, Powell, who, who just kind of introduced the audit service plan, kind of oversees the financial operations for, for the branch. So to give you some idea of kind of the general core responsibilities that we do for financial planning, um, obviously, as the name entails, you know, we provide full financial planning and analysis across not only the CVRD, but to the number of entities that we help also support. So in, in addition to ourselves, that also includes the uh, Comox Strathcona Waste Management Board and the separate financial plan that we undertake through that uh, a greater board. That also includes support to the uh, Comox Strathcona Regional Hospital District and also to the North Island 911 Corporation. And part of that financial planning responsibility includes looking at a number of different kind of items over the course of the year. So that really involves the you know, coordination and preparation of the annual uh, budgets and, and financial reporting, both on the kind of short, uh, short term and long range kind of financial plans, including any required estimates um, or analysis that needs to be undertaken over the course of the year. That also does uh, include, you know, really taking a look at the annual tax requisition calculation. So it's a big part of what we do kind of at the end of uh, every annual process. And that includes, you know, determining what the apportionment between participants is within each of the services that we are uh, putting forth financial plans for, and obviously making sure that those are being submitted, whether it's to the province or to the member municipalities, um, you know, for, for inclusion within their budget processes. That also does include um, looking at, you know, kind of the overall revenue sources um, that we manage as an organization. So that can include uh, things like our taxation, our, our tolls and, and user fees, uh, can also include debt grants and of course, reserve management. Um, and then we also do, you know, kind of the, the investment management uh, for the organization as well, and really kind of drive the, the policies and principles around that. To give you a sense of, of you know, kind of how we undertake that over the year, our current department complimentation is as 1.5 FTE. So that's comprised of two staff members. So we are a very small and nimble team. Uh, that consists of myself as the manager of financial planning, and then also our senior financial planning analyst, which is Kelly Broughton. Uh, we are currently recruiting for a, a financial planning analyst, just given the, the uh, kind of continued expansion and breadth of the number of services we're looking over and also given the uh, increased complexity that I'll be speaking to later in the presentation, uh, we really feel it's time to kind of grow some capacities within our branch and, and our department to really make sure that we're providing the best possible support uh, and, 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 and enhance services to, to the branch and to the organizations, including yourselves. maybe change it from it. Thank you, Lisa. So to give you a sense of kind of really what guides us, uh, you know, from a day-to-day -day basis, there's kind of the, those, those two key principles. First of all, of course, legislation. So the Local Government Act, in particular, Part 11, really is what kind of dictates, um, you know, how regional districts undertake their annual financial planning processes and how we kind of undertake our financial management. So, you know, that section of the Local Government Act really kind of provides us kind of our, our, our kind of guiding um, guidance around you know how that that um, process needs to be undertaken 
the timing of that process. So as most of you are aware, we do have to have a, a, an annual adopted budget bylaw done by March 31st of every year. So that's really the, the, the ultimate deadline we're always working towards. It also does you know, provide the minimum time frame that we have to budget to. So currently that's a five-year financial plan by legislation. But as I'll be speaking later, we're always looking to do better and, and more than that. And then it also does speak to the fact that obviously as part of this process, we do have to have a, a public engagement piece to make sure that the general public is, is certainly aware of the services we deliver and how we deliver those, but also kind of the financial implications to that. And I will be speaking to kind of how we, you know, currently undertake uh, uh, that public engagement and how we tend to continue to augment and enhance that as we go forward. The second uh, you know, uh, guiding piece of legislation, of course, is the community charter. So there are all aspects of the community charter uh, that do apply with respect to you know, some of that financial management, uh, particularly around things like permissive tax and, and those kinds of things. So you know, we, we are really kind of governed by those two primary pieces of legislation. From an internal perspective, there are a number of, of kind of governing or, or guiding principal policies that really drive what we do. Uh, we have four distinct financial planning policies that really kind of drive our day to day. Um, you know, first and foremost, we have the financial planning policy that guides the you know the majority of our CDRD related services. But of course, given we also manage some other entities or help support some other entities, we also do have. Um, uh, unique financial policies uh, or financial planning policies that, that support those entities as well. That includes our Black Creek Oyster Bay services. Uh, so, of course, that's the fire and the water services that are part of that kind of cross-regional district committee. We also do have a distinct uh, financial planning policy that, that governs our uh, Comox Strathcona Waste Management Board and service. And then, of course, we have a, a separate one for the hospital district as well. We have a number of other board supported policies that also do kind of provide us some context to, to, to how we move forward. We have an investment policy and that investment policy is something that we'll be looking at in earnest in, in 2023 to kind of update and enhance. Uh, we also have the permissive tax exemption policy. So many of you will recall that uh, annually we do bring a series of permissive tax e exemption requests from uh, groups throughout the, the uh, uh, region that are looking to uh, you know, make application in that vein. So we do have a policy that guides that. We also have the support service and other allocation policies. So this is the one that uh, you know kind of really drives how general administration is supported throughout the organization. Uh, you may be uh, familiar with the fact that we don't really tax for general administration, but rather we really rely on this policy to really drive how the, all of the services that general administration does support and provides guidance to are, are kind of covering those costs. And so there's a whole policy that kind of outlines kind of a fairness and trans, uh, transparent kind of process that really looks at a number of, you know, th basically three core key components and then some general support that kind of really kind of drives that. And then the last policy that, you know, is applicable for this is our tangible capital asset reporting. And we touched on a bit of that when, when uh, we covered the audit service plan, just with respect of really making sure we're looking at that kind of asset management and asset reporting. So this is just a, a kind of a visual representation of what our annual financial planning process looks like. So it will be familiar for many of you. Um, you know, it, it, you know, for, for the public, you know, they tend to see kind of the process really when it kicks off and we, we launch everything out in January and then kind of wrap everything up in March, but it is certainly a much more comprehensive process than that. We really do kick off in earnest in that kind of July to August timeframe. And that's when we're really starting to have conversations internally with our branches and our departments around their, their kind of service level and workforce planning needs. Uh, it is actually a very uh, key component to the annual financial planning process. So it's, it's one we do spend some considerable time on to really assess uh, and given the nature of regional districts, you know, we have to really make sure that all of our staff are allocated appropriately to the number of services that we deliver. 
So we really kind of look at those allocations on an annual basis, but this is where we also work with the branches to really determine based on, again, that, that service level of that work plan, what are any of the new positions that may they may be considering or requesting? And then really we help support them in the development of the business cases associated with that. And then there is a process internally for you know putting that through to the executive management team and certainly to the CAO before it hits the uh, budget presentation table. From that, we really kick things off in earnest in that early fall time frame in September and October. That's when I am, you know, pulling my various budget managers together and really having, you know, some of that key messaging and, and launch point discussions with them. Um, and, and, you know, certainly, you know, be, you know, um, identifying anything that may come from certainly yourselves with respect to strategic planning or strategic initiatives and making sure those are, you know, being reflected and, and included in the financial plan. Uh, one that we'll be speaking to kind of momentarily is, is the corporate energy and emission planning. So certainly for this year, that is an item we've really been speaking to our budget managers a lot about, okay, you know, that, that, that policy and, and plan has now been kind of endorsed. How do we ensure that we're rolling that out uh, within our financial plans and really providing you the information that you need so that you can see that you know we are certainly you know making sure we're taking strides to reflect that within the, 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 the budgets of each of the services. We then really kick on, on in, into the, the budget development phase. You know, so we spend a number of months really working with the various branches, fine tuning those budgets, and then ultimately presenting those through the CAO for, for his thoughts and comments before we're finalizing thing to really present that to you in, in that later January timeframe. And really that's what kicks off kind of the, the, the public uh, face of the process. From there, you know, we move into finalizing the budget in March and April. And again, in that time frame is when we're putting forth the uh, annual financial planning bylaw. And then, you know, in April, that's when we're really starting to report out from the previous year with respect to our annual financial statements and, and, and financial reporting. And what we've also done kind of new in the last couple of years, in addition to a bit of this graphic and the information that is contained on our financial planning uh, page within the website is we also do have a short two minute video that really tries to, you know, kind of articulate to the public what the financial planning process looks like, how they can kind of keep apprised of uh, what's going on as budgets are presented, certainly how they can get involved and engaged in the process. So that that was kind of developed for the first time uh, back in, in 2021, and we'll be looking to update that again this year. So just to give you a sense, you know, of kind of the, the number of services that we that we provide and help support with financial planning. So currently uh, going into 2023, we will have 103 distinct services across the organization. Uh, that does include two new services um, that we are looking forward to for 2023. Uh, that includes the new regional parks and trail service, and that also includes a new service for the Graham Lake Water Local Service Area which is a uh, improvement district um, that we are um, going to be taking over effective January 1st. And as you can see, there, that just provides you a bit of a breakdown of the number of services that, that are applied to each of the participants. Those, those numbers are uh, a little bit old, out of date, um, so we'll be updating that, but at least gives you a pretty good reflection as to, for each municipality and each electoral area, the number of services that we do, do manage on behalf of the organization. And of course, we do that across all eight core service areas uh, within the organization, including um, solid waste and certainly the uh, hospital district as well. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just wanted to give particularly for the new directors a sense of once we start rolling out the, the consolidated uh, financial plan to you on January 24th, there are a number of meetings over that next seven or eight weeks that we do undertake to fully inform you and give your opportunity for reflection and, and discussion on the various service budgets. So on January 24th, we do present that consolidated look to you that gives you a sense of overall, this is kind of what we're seeing and, and, and kind of give you a sense of, you know, kind of globally where we're landing. Uh, we then do publish our proposed financial plan to the website no later than January 31st. And then we really kick off into the individual budget uh, presentations, starting off with Black Creek Oyster Bay Service Committee on, on January 31st. And then given the number of budgets we do present to our electoral areas, we tend to break that into three distinct meetings because uh, they can be uh, 
pretty long and uh, you know we certainly respect the the director's time and, and making sure they have you know the, the time and energy to really look at those uh, and then moving on to the next slide you know again just continuing through the process over the next several weeks uh, our anticipate we're anticipating right now bringing forward the recommended financial plan which is what we build the uh, annual financial planning bylaw on to you on March 21st and then do final reading and adoption on March 31st or sorry, March 23rd. So just to give you some idea of some of the priorities or the initiatives that we're kind of working on within, within financial planning, um, as I mentioned, you know, really one of the, the, the key things we're, we're undertaking and, and really kind of reflecting within financial planning this year is the implementation of that corporate energy and emissions plan. You know, so we've already started, you know, looking at the, the whole internal cost of carbon, how that's going to get reflected with each service budget and been, you know, certainly speaking to our budget managers quite a bit about, you know, making sure that, you know, definitely uh, certainly on their on their capital planning that they're really looking at how they can undertake, you know, um, their commitments under their individual uh, service plans within the corporate energy and emissions plan and start reflecting those and kind of moving forward with uh, those GHD reductions over the next, uh, you know, uh, number of years. You know, one of the big things we also are continuing to look at rolling out is our long-term financial planning. So, as I mentioned uh, when speaking to the, to the you know, the uh, legislation, I mean, we are obligated to do at minimum a five-year financial plan, but certainly we're always striving to, you know, build upon that and kind of stretch ourselves to, you know, that that longer time frame. You know, so we're certainly looking at at, at increasing that out to even 10 years. And, and as you'll see in the financial plans, we're even, you know, doing that with a lot of our capital budgets now uh, to really give you uh, that, that longer term perspective. Um, you know, and a big part of that is really, you know, kind of making sure that we're looking at that sustainable service delivery. You know, the longer look that we can take, the more we can kind of look at projecting, you know, stable funding um, and, and a good mix of funding, you know, so that we are making sure that we're, we're providing the best possible services we can, uh, you know, in an, an effective and a, in a cost effective way. Um, and also looking at kind of that that big asset management piece that we will be continuing to roll out over the next number of years to really make sure we're looking at that that effective and, and, and cost um, um, appropriate uh, asset renewal and replacement. Uh, coupled with that is the enhanced, uh, you know, public engagement in, in the budget process, and I do have a slide forthcoming that speaks to to that point a, a little bit more. Uh, but it's something we're certainly looking to continue to see and find ways to engage the public more in the financial planning process, and really make sure that we're getting information out to them so that they they feel they have a good awareness of the services that we provide and how we're providing those from a fiscal perspective. Um, I, I spoke earlier about you know really making sure that we're we're augmenting the support with an analysis that we can provide around the revenue or funding source planning. So we you know really you know are, are are moving towards working with our branches a lot closer on on kind of looking at all of those various types of revenues and and you know you know how those are are being kind of. Uh, you know, partnered together in and looking at the best possible strategies and funding mixes when we're putting forth a financial plan. So that can include the you know property and parcel tax, water and sewer tolls, user fees, debt grants, and of course reserves. We're also looking at uh, you know implementing you know a, a fiscal sustainability framework and strategy. This is something that uh, I believe our former CFO Mariah Fort had brought to this table a couple of years ago just to introduce the concept. This is really where you know we're kind of looking at that that overall or holistic uh, way of of providing kind of you know a a, a good you know. A good, a good overall process that really kind of lands on four or four core principles being fairness, transparency, uh, stability, and efficiency. So it includes a number of different pieces, including looking at, um, you know, determining, you know, the best possible base service levels, looking at those asset management pieces, grant management, debt management, and the like. So there's a number of pieces we'll be kind of building on as part of that comprehensive policy review uh, over the next while. 
And then lastly, we're, we're continuing to look at our, our various budget processes and, you know, can we make those, you know, a bit more efficient? Can we make them better? Can we make them more transparent? And certainly looking at how we build on the tools that we use to, to kind of do that. So, of course, we use a, a primary budget software being Questica that really helps us support kind of our budget build out. And, and yet we always have to look at, you know, the, the various um, tools and software that are kind of feeding into that. So whether we're looking at an asset management system, which we are actually implementing this year uh, within our water services, we always have to make sure these, these systems are integrated, uh, certainly are speaking to one another and that they're giving us the best possible information uh, and that we're looking at that from a, from a cost effectiveness. Because uh, at the end of the day, we're really trying to, you know, kind of address and build out our departmental capacities, and, you know, because we always want to be providing the best possible support and, and much deeper analysis, given that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're really looking at some increased complexity and diversity in the number of uh, certainly capital projects that we're undertaking, but certainly on the operational side as well, just given economic challenges and things of that nature. And then just lastly, um, you know, quickly on an enhancing public engagement into the budget. So this is something we're really looking at uh, undertaking over the next several years. Uh, we want to make sure that we, you know, we are taking a look at that greater awareness for the public of who CBRD is and, and what we do for those, you know, eight core service areas, including, uh, you know, plus the hospital and for the solid waste board. We really want to make sure we're increasing, you know, people's understanding of how the annual budget uh, and planning process works. And certainly, you know, again, giving, you know, increasing their knowledge of the climate mitigation strategies that are coming that we're already starting to build within our financial planning process and how that will impact, uh, you know, financial plans going forward and how we intend to reach those those targets. And lastly, we're always cognizant of making sure that, uh, you know, we're providing, you know, the best possible uh, value to taxpayers and at the same time trying to bring that within, you know, financial means. Um, you know, so we will be continuing to provide those tax impact comparat uh, comparisons for ratepayers. Uh, in fact, we are looking at a pretty uh, major revamp of our tax inserts for the for the rural areas this year, and that's something we'll actually be bringing forward for um, the electoral areas considerations in the new year. But at the end of the day, you know, there's a number of things we do in this area with respect to ensuring that there's information available on our website. Uh, you know, we do, you know, put things out through things like social media. We're continuing to look at improving our, uh, our budget video, but we're also looking to undertake some new things this year. So we're looking at uh, creating, uh, you know, a how to read your CVRD tax bill, for example, so that, you know, when people get that rural property tax notice, they understand what components are, are, are part of um, the, the regional district and kind of what those mean. We're also looking at building out educational campaigns around the financial plan and looking at some direct uh, engagement with our certainly our, our electoral area residents and also looking at how we can certainly reach out to, to our municipal partners and, and their councils to really make sure they feel comfortable with and understand you know, what's within the various budgets that they participate in. So I've just provided a, a, a URL to our, our, our budget website. Uh, that link stays current. So uh, you know, every, every financial plan you know, is updated to reflect what the current budget is. So I would really encourage uh, folks to kind of check that out and take a look at some of the information that we've provided there. And that's all I have for financial planning. Uh, maybe before I turn it over to Carol, Karen, certainly welcome any questions. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Looking around the room. Do you see a few here? Oh, oh starting with uh, Director McCollum. Thanks, Chair, and uh, thanks for the presentation, Kevin. I had a question about investment policy. Um, it came up in a few places in your um, presentation, and um, the previous board passed a resolution seeking an update in our policy that uh, focuses on environmental, social, and governance, as well as um, fossil fuel free as um, guiding some, providing some guidance around the values in which we hold our and manage our reserves. And I'm wondering if you have any um, policy that's forthcoming that we can expect or, or where that's at. I know we've had a lot of staffing, a, a series of staffing challenges on that. So just hoping you can provide an update. 
most definitely through the chair to Director McCollum. So yes, you're absolutely right. That is still very much on our radar. Um, we it is something we definitely owe to, to to the board, and we intend to do that in 2023. So that'll be part of some of the policy work that we'll be kind of undertaking. So yeah, definitely look forward to that. I'll be working with Lucy on the development of, of those policies, and we'll be bringing something back for your consideration. It's great to hear. Thank you. And Director Shellycock, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, and through the Chair, uh, similar to uh, Director McCollum's comments around ESG, um, one of the first points in your slide on financial planning was the implementation of energy and emissions plan. Um, does the plan include a uh, carbon budget for the, the budget itself? So through the chair to the director. So yeah, so the, the corporate energy and emission plan really kind of helped develop individual work plans for each of our departments around what will what can they do to really start addressing their GHG emissions and how we can start reducing those. So what we will be introducing in 2023 is the um, internal cost of carbon. So what that means is we will be looking at the various emissions that you know are, are representative in each of those services. We will be doing a calculation on that. That will then become a cost to that service. And what that will then represent is a contribution to what's going to be a newly established uh, uh, internal cost of carbon reserve. We'll be then using those reserves to, um, you know, and, and we're still in in kind of looking at developing how you know the application process so to speak will look like uh, but once we have that reserve established and some some dollars um, you know contributed to it we'll be looking at how we can use those dollars to really address you know some of those key priority areas within the organization that could benefit from some support to really start addressing those ghd reductions so there will be a, a, a policy that will really be outlining that that will be forthcoming and then we'll be looking at you know kind of how we kind of um, you know implement that within the financial plans. Yeah, thank you. And just as a follow up, that's really helpful. I appreciate the context of the the timeline and what you're working, uh, where, where you're working towards. Um, uh, I'm. I noticed the word corporate and in the language in your response internal. And I guess I have a curiosity, is there any capacity internally for financial services to also engage in that same process within the, the confines of how the RD supports, for example, community organizations and or services that are outside the, the corporate entity of the RD? Madam Chair, I can respond to that to say that uh, our uh, staff are going to be bringing forward to the Electoral Area Services Committee the um, a, um, the response to the community and how we might be able to participate in that. It's it's being done through the Electoral Area Service in terms of that's the influence that the regional district has is through the Electoral Areas. But uh, those reports and such will be available to all so you can see what, what's being done. But that's probably coming in the new year to, to the EASC. Director Hardy? Yeah, if we could go back a couple of slides. I saw and um, there's me mention of meeting federal targets. I was just wondering if there's BC targets that need to be met as well, or are we just focusing on federal targets? Through the chair director, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, I, I probably should have included those as well. So yeah, I mean, we're looking at, you know, everything that, you know, um, both provincially and federally that we are, we are, you know, looking at really kind of achieving as far as those GHG emission levels, those kind of 2030 and 2050 type targets. Thanks. Okay, I don't see any further questions. And is there a uh, part two to the presentation? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Hello, everybody. My name is Karen Garrett. And I'm the manager of procurement services. It's my pleasure to provide you with some orientation on how the procurement function is structured here in the CVRD. Oh, thanks, Lisa. So procurement services is a department within the financial services branch and is responsible for procuring goods and services that the CVRD needs to deliver services across the region. A significant amount of procurement law and regulation exists. And our department establishes the policy and procedures to help guide our departments so that we are operating within these regulations. The CVRD is committed to fair, open, transparent, competitive processes that ensure best value supply arrangements with consideration towards total cost, 
quality, expertise, as well as social value and environmental sustainability. Fiscal responsibility is a strategic driver for the CVRD, and procurement services is a key support for branches as they work to provide affordable and reliable services to the citizens and businesses throughout the regional district. So the operation of a public procurement function, such as the one at the CVRD, is largely driven by legislation from senior levels of government. These include the Community Charter and the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, as well as the three main trade agreements that impact local, procurement pro local government procurement. These include non-discriminatory non access to procurement opportunities at established thresholds. The CVRD's procurement policy framework is divided into two pieces of policy. Bylaw 510 delegates the authority of the board for authorizing procurement transactions to staff as approved in the approved financial plan and the procurement policy. The Auditor General for Local Government audited the CVRD for operational procurement and published its findings in 2015. The recommendations raised by the Auditor General have been actioned and included in the CVRD procurement policy and practice, such as updated and improved guidance to staff on conflict of interest and ethical considerations, debriefing unsuccessful bidders, vendor performance management, and the creation of a separate purchasing card policy. The procurement policy as approved by the CVRD board outlines the roles and responsibilities of CVRD directors and staff in procurement. It establishes thresholds for signing authority as well as thresholds that offer guidance on what procurement strategy is to be undertaken. The policy also explicitly states that procurement transactions cannot be completed unless budgeted for in the board approved financial plan. The policy offers internal guidance to the organization and external guidance to the marketplace on topics that include separation of roles to remove any potential or perceived appearance of political influence or bias the board recognizes the need to be removed from procurement practices from the time of procurement is issued to the market to the point where a contract has been awarded to the successful bidder except where the board is presented with a recommendation to approve the contract award in accordance with this policy lobbying no vendor or anyone involved in preparing bids or proposals shall lobby any elected official or CVR staff member in an effort to secure a contract. During a competitive procurement process, all communications are to be made through the Financial, financial Services Department unless the procurement document exp explicitly states otherwise. Best value procurements are procurement processes that consider more than just cost, but also give consideration to quality, expertise, as well as environmental and social sustainability. Sustainable procurement in an Effort to leverage procurement dollars is a benefit to the community and society. The CVRD may include the consideration of sustainability and best value procurements. Sustainability considerations could include attention to environmental, ethical, and corporate social responsibility, as well as social value. Currently, we are working on updating this section of the policy to better tie to the corporate energy and emissions plan, and those changes will be presented to the board at a future meeting. The policy further ha policy has uh, a couple other of safeguards to include um, to ensure that the board maintains authority over the procurement function. These include two signatures for large dollar contracts. The board has the ability to identify procurements or projects that they wish to approve prior to contract award. This would occur during the financial planning process. The policy authorizes the CAO to spend outside the financial plan should an emergency situation arise and the CAO must report back to the board on these purchases. The policy also allows for the CAO to transfer his powers to a CAO of a member municipality for such an emergency. The policy also includes language specific to ensuring purchases happen as presented in the financial plan. These safeguards are to ensure that there are checks and balances throughout the procurement process and that the CVRD operates within that approved budget. So it's good to think of procurement in two capacities, operational procurement and capital procurement. Operational procurement is often thought as a transactional spend. It mainly constitutes a large volume of low value spend across hundreds of vendors at the CVRD. The CVRD has structured procurement that is, so that is, it is decentralized for low value procurement and centralized for medium to high value procurement. Branches are authorized to finalize low value purchases using P cards, purchasing cards, and purchase orders. This ensures 
low risk procurement at these levels is operationally efficient and not weighed down by traditional bureaucratic structures. Budget managers are responsible for managing their budgets and ensuring budget dollars are available prior to the purchase order or contract being issued. Where there's a lot of transactional spend within individual commodities in any given year, such as office supplies, procurement services will look to establish supply contracts to secure preferred pricing, budget certainty, and proper risk allocation. The second part of the procurement function largely, largely deals with capital spend. These types of purchases are driven by the capital expenditure side of the financial plan and are typically thought of as one-time spend. They can carry more risk, are typically more strategic in nature, and are centralized throughout the, through the procurement department. Capital procurement is largely molded by our trade agreement obligations and a variety of industry standards from local government, as well as the design and construction communities. In the case of capital project competitions, the procurement department will draft, negotiate, and finalize construction and professional services contracts. We'll also ensure that all bonding, insurance, and other commercial contractor obligations are being fulfilled. Many of the controls in place to support operational procurement are also in place for capital spend. For larger and more complex capital projects, such as the water treatment plant, organics facility, and the sewer conveyance project, we have engaged additional consulting professionals, specifically a fairness advisor. The role of the fairness advisor is to act as an independent observer with respect to fairness of the procurement process and to report on whether the project team has fairly implemented the procurement process in accordance with the project procurement documents. The CVRD is and continues to be committed to transparency when spending taxpayer dollars. This is achieved through the use of public competitive processes that are fully transparent to bidders and the general public. For medium high value spend, transparency is assured through posting opportunities on BC Bid and the CVRD website through the CVRD's new bids and tenders e-bidding platform. BC Bid is the main provincial electronic tendering site that we are legally obligated to advertise on, with thousands of vendors signed up to receive notifications of the CVRD's opportunities. I'm excited to announce that we've recently launched our new B bids and tenders e-bidding platform. And this new platform will allow our vendors to easily find, review, and submit on our future procurement opportunities. Our procurement practices include strict communication and evaluation procedures to ensure all interested bidders are treated equally and fairly. We fully inform every bidder of the successful contractor and provide debriefs and advise unsuccessful bidders where they fell short. Further, the procurement department has processes in place to actively monitor vendor performance and support the various CVRD departments in communicating our expectations where performance could be improved. The procurement department is also responsible in managing the disposition of assets that are no longer required. The CVRD primarily sells off surplus assets through public auction. These auctions are managed through the province and provides the CVRD with access to a large group of buyers to ensure a competitive market return. Often the assets are at the end of their life and the return may be low, but the CVRD benefits by keeping the old assets out of the landfill and not having to pay for their disposal. Payment is guaranteed prior to pickup and the CVRD maintains signed release forms to ensure liability for the goods are transferred to the buyer. Just a little flavor of some of the recent procurements that financial services has supported is the Murphill Fire Hall and, and truck and equipment, the Regional Organics Compost Facility, and the Denman Cross Island Trail Project with the staircase and trail construction. And that's it for me. Oh, sorry. Last slide. Great. Thank you, Karen. Are there any questions? Dr. Shalika. Thank you, Chair, and thanks for the presentation on our procurement policy. Um, I'm curious if there's been any consideration around uh, preferences, uh, again, given the commitment to reconciliation from this board uh, around uh, preferential procurement policy for our local Indigenous partners. And then secondarily, um, can you speak to, if at all, how social procurement policy or practices um, play into our procurement? So through the chair to the director, um, yes, the second part of the question is we do uh, include um, social value on 
quite a number of our procurements. So we include that in our evaluation. So some of the things that we look at, um, we ask our contractors if they provide a living wage. Um, do they offer apprenticeships or um, additional training support for their staff? Um, for certain projects, will they be hiring locally in, in certain situations? Uh, the Denman Island Cross, Denman Cross Island Trail project actually um, was one of the first smaller construction projects that we included a, a social value statement where we had each contractor kind of fill in those questions to um, see exactly where you know those contractors were coming from but also where their staff were going to be coming from and do how do they support you know local suppliers for different materials so we do um try to include it in as many projects as we can yeah and then we um give it a different uh weighting value in the evaluation um the first part of that question um regarding the uh inclusion 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 of indigenous indigenous procurement is that is something that we are looking at um i've drafted some language for it um but i have to fine fine tune it and i believe uh yeah i i, I just need to fine tune it a little bit more because it's not where it needs to be yet <laughs> just as a follow-up thank you chair um in terms of the evaluation, once the uh, procurement uh, proposals have come in from the, the contractors or the vendors, um, obviously there's an evaluation process that occurs and happy to hear that there's a social um, value lens and those, those are the kind of questions that I was looking for. So really happy to hear that. Can you speak to the evaluation matrix that is either done by staff in terms of the weighing of both uh, other financial considerations, uh, project specific considerations and those social values? So there, it's a range depending on the project. Um, typically, the the minimum score out of one hundred would be ten, so ten percent of the overall. Um, it has gone up as high as twenty percent in other things, um, but yeah, it it'll be a range depending on what the project is. Yeah. Thank you. Don't see any further lights. So thank you, both Karen and Kevin. And we're on receipt. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Item three is orientation on the Comox Valley Tourism Service. Second. Grant and Helian, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Directors. And Lisa Kilpatrick will come forward to present this orientation on the uh, visitor, the tourism service. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Through the chairs to, or the chair to the directors. Uh, so presenting an overview of the Comox Valley Tourism Service Function 550. So this is a new, new service as of last year. And the purpose of the service is to provide promotion and marketing for the Comox Valley as a whole. We provide destination marketing as well as visitor information services to welcome the tourists to our area. A key, a key component to the service is the formation of partnerships with community organizations as well as service and industry. The participants are the electoral areas with the exception of Denman and Hornby Island, the city of Courtney and our newest member, the village of Cumberland. Comox participates uh, via Comox, the Comox Valley Tourist, Tourism Service Agreement, and we have that agreement until 2026 with Comox. The Board of Directors is a governing body over this service. We also have an administrative committee, which is made up of staff from the participants, as well as Comox. And then we have a tourism advisory committee, which is made up of industry stakeholders that provide our contractor with guidance. And the tourism advisory committee is not an appointed, appointed committee of the board. It is an appointed committee of our subcontractor, which is 4VI. So 4VI, formerly Tourism Vancouver Island or, or TVI, delivers uh, the services for us. This is their second year of delivery. And they focus on visitor information services, the destination marketing, the management of the MRDT, which I'll talk about shortly, stakeholder engagement and partnership development. Um, they are available to present and, and meet with any of the participants, uh, or sorry, the participants councils at any time. 
and they also uh, provide the appointment and coordination of the Tourism Advisory Committee. The service has an asset, and that asset is the visitor center, the land and property, and the service owns and maintains that property. That property is used primarily by 4VI to deliver the visitor information services and CVRD staff, and will be available for nonprofit rental meeting and event rentals in 2023. So just a little overview on the MRDT because it does provide a significant contribution into the service. So the MRDT is the municipal, regional and district tax. It's a collection of 2%, um, which is collected by the accommodators within the city of Courtney. It's paid by the province of the to the city of Courtney. So the funds, funds flow through the city of Courtney and it funds approximately $250,000 of the destination marketing plan that is delivered by 4VI. It, we use that to leverage other funding, which is include which includes the destination BC funding. And the City of Courtney approved, Council approves the annual tactical plan and budget that goes to the province annually. So in terms of uh, CVRD staff management of the service, uh, we have that at a 0.25 FTE. So 2022 budget, we had uh, the operating budget was 520,000. Uh, the 250,000 from MRDT is in addition to that, and that flows through the city of Courtney. So we don't see it reflected in our uh, budgets here at CVRD. So our revenue sources uh, is the requisition, the service agreement fee with COMOX, destination B BC grants and reserves. The main key expenditures around uh, this, the service is the destination marketing and visitor information services, and the maintenance and operation of the visitor center, as well as some planning processes uh, and debt servicing on the mortgage for the building. The service does have a future expenditure reserve fund and a capital reserve fund, particularly uh, for the asset. And the capital projects in 2022 focused on the building restoration and mechanical systems repairs. Upcoming projects uh, for this service, which um, are happening uh, in 2023 and will come to the board will, with a uh, complete scope of these activities in early 2023, include the uh, tourism strategic planning process so, so that we uh, look at having a regional tourism strategy. Looking at a possible expansion of the municipal regional development tax for the region sorry, regional district, that's an error there, uh, tax throughout the region and contemplating the future of the visitor center building and property. Some of the key considerations for the, the current operations of the service, but also the future is uh, engagement with Comox First Nations, mobile visitor servicing. We've piloted that over a few years and we'll be exploring how we expand on that service throughout our participating areas. Shoulder season destination developed to maximize the times of the year where we would like to see more people here supporting our businesses. And then sustainable tourism approach and the natural asset management. So the sustainable tourism approach, ensuring that we have um, we're considering the impacts of our visitors on our area and how we can do that through a natural asset management approach. So a short and sweet, and I'll take any questions. Thank you, Lisa. Um, I actually did have a question about um, the advisory committee, the MRDT. Um, so that is something that 4VI um, is looking after, but I was just wondering if is the makeup of the committee um, determined through provincial um, legislation, or is it something that 4BI um, has uh, control over? Mm -hmm. So the, the committee was a commitment in the application to the province for by the city of Courtney for the MRDT that uh, we would consult and have an advisory committee that was made up of tourism stakeholders throughout the region. So as staff with, along with 4VI and with the city of Courtney, we contemplated the makeup of that committee and that uh, so that the committee does reflect um, the region in its 11 participants. Right now, because the uh, because 
it is the city of Courtney that is collecting all of the MRDT. Six of those seats are from uh, stakeholder participants from within the city of Courtney. Okay. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be made up of hotel ears, for example. No, it's a range of uh, folks from the tourism industry. So uh, we have uh, arts and culture, um, we have um, outdoor recreation, we have uh, Airbnb from a rural from the rural area. So we look to from the from the perspective of the the committee to have a broad range there. Great, thanks for that. Uh, I see that Director Arbor has his hand up online. Yeah, thanks. Just just a, a small point, uh, not that it matters that much, but worth mentioning. So I, Courtney is not the only jurisdiction that collects MRDT uh, in the region. They, they may in relation to this service, but it's worth highlighting that Mount Washington collects MRDT and in a separate stream, and so does Hornby Island. Thank you. Thanks for that information. Okay, I don't see any further lights. And are you finished the presentation, Lisa? Yes. All you. right. So we're on receipt. All in favor of receipt? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. And we're on to item four, human resources. Grant and Helian, thank you. I'll pass it to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. Our last orientation for this evening and James Warren, a Deputy CAO, will come forward and provide for you the orientation for human resources of the CBRD. Thank you, Russell, and good evening, directors. So thank you for the opportunity to present on the Human Resources Department today. I'm going to be covering a few different topics, including how the service delivery is structured, historic changes in staffing, and how that relates to service levels and some of the pending opportunities and pressures for the CVRD. My goal here is that there would be three main themes that I would want directors to take away from the presentation. One being service delivery at the CVRD is dependent on people. And that covers everyone from lifeguards to accountants to engineers to heavy equipment operators and all sorts of people and professions in between. Secondly, given the range of complexities and priorities at regional districts, we feel that the staffing plan that we develop is balanced and it meets the needs of the CBRD. We deeply engage with department managers and staff to understand their obligations and challenges. We look for synergies across departments and branches to align activities. And we are very responsive to board drivers and priorities in, des in designing the staffing structure and proposing um, new positions. And, and thirdly, uh, changing in changes in staffing levels are tightly linked to service levels and operations. And those levels are driven by four different uh, conditions, regulatory changes, increased volume of actions, new and expanded activities, and technological change. So CVRD services are delivered um, primarily in three ways. Uh, through contracts with third parties, with community partnerships, and in-house staffing. Uh, examples of the in-house staffing would be at our recreation facilities, in our land use um, planning and building departments, um, administration staff, and many other examples. Regular analysis is performed to optimize the methods of service delivery um, from quality performance, fiscal, social, and other perspectives. The graph on the right describes the makeup of staff uh, as QP, USW, uh, and exempt in 2022. The uh, USW, United Steel Workers, that represents our uh, recreation facilities staff, and QP would be the office here as well as our water and treatment, uh, sewage, and uh, the landfill operations. As a basis to describe the HR department, you can see here that we have six primary focal points. Um, and I also reference the CVRD's core values, which guide the services that we offer. I'll get into a few of these topics in more detail in the coming slides, but just want to note here that with respect to organizational design and development, we're at a fairly critical point in time. The CVRD is an organization that is not so big that we have highly specialized individuals in every facet of every department. However, we do enjoy being large enough to have some expertise in a few different areas, enabling improved service delivery in more effective ways. Um, you met Karen Garrett earlier, and that's an example where recently uh, we were able to include the procurement expertise with the organization. That was partly in response to an assessment by the Auditor General for Local Government. Um, 
and that expertise has relieved the burden of procurement that used to rest entirely on every individual department, and it allows for a more focused effort on fairness in procurement and purchasing and achieving value for money. I raise this as an example now because um, now is an appropriate time to better understand what other synergies and expertise is needed and affirming the most appropriate structure for that expertise to best enable the CBRD to continue delivering quality services in the future. Study work will be undertaken in 2023 to assess some of those opportunities to better position the workforce. Year over year, we are committed to inform the board about the staffing levels and changes over time. This slide illustrates the previous five years of full-time equivalents and compares those values to the remuneration and expenses, as well as operational expenditures. The information can be interpreted in several ways, but I think it's important to note that the percent change for FTEs salaries and wages, and operating costs are all relatively constant. As expenses have increased due to a variety of conditions, but notably volume of activities, increased regulations, and expanding actions and services, the number of FTEs and related costs have also increased. Two other points to note here are that the CVRD structures its workforce in two fundamental ways. The permanent workforce are all of those full-time equivalent positions that we budget for, and that work force relates to the full-time, part-time, and casual positions needed to deliver CVRD services. We also budget for a variable workforce for term positions, including summer students uh, and backfilling vacancies or situations where extended leaves are occurring. On an annual basis, we will present to the board all of those new full-time equivalent positions that we propose are needed to deliver the CVRD service, and that might include brand new roles or an additional lifeguard or waste management attendant. For 2023, we are aiming to present those positions to you on December 20th, um, following which we'll elaborate on the positions during the financial plan presentations in uh, January, February, and March. Looking forward, we are able to budget and estimate fiscal impacts associated with existing collective agreements, which are fairly straightforward, and can also anticipate changes associated with exempt roles. Salaries for exempt roles depend on our job family matrix and compares our roles with similar roles in our local in other local governments that are similar in scope and scale to the CBRD. The exempt salary structure is currently out for a marker review. We generally conduct a review um, once every three or four years to ensure that salaries we provide are competitive and we are receiving good value for money from our exempt workforce. The current structure was determined in 2019 and no increases have occurred since then. Staff have received increases for, for performance over that time. And some positions have moved along their salary structures towards the midpoint of their salaries, but the midpoints themselves have not changed. Following the external market review, we can expect that the midpoints will change, but we're not sure what the change will be. Some midpoints from 2019 to 2022 may increase by only a few percent, whereas others might increase anywhere from six to 10%. Regardless, affordability and fiscal responsibility is of paramount consideration for budgeting exempt salaries, and if a large difference exists between a person's salary and their, mis their, mid their position's midpoint, we might suggest the salary increase modestly over several years before that person reaches their midpoint. Um, and of course, performance is, a, is an underlying factor to any sort of increase. One final point before I move on from forecasting salary budgets is that a CVRD is in a position where valuing our current employees is critical. I'll talk about the, the current employees market that you've probably heard about and how difficult it can be to recruit staff. Therefore, we want to celebrate and support our current staff for the body of work the CBRD is delivering. The other point to this slide is restructuring and organizational improvement. In essence, positions and departments at the CBRD are regularly reviewed with an eye to improving service delivery. Sometimes technology affords a change, and other times the labor market offers an opportunity to change how we do our business. In short, we're always looking at our existing staff, responsibilities, and demands to better deliver our services. We also think about whether we are reaching thresholds in complexity or service delivery that might drive a need for a change. Sometimes that change might result in a new position being proposed. As an example, I mentioned the introduction of the specialized procurement role several years ago that has resulted in a, in a tremendous improvement to how the CBRD purchases its goods and services. Um, similarly, we're reaching a point where consideration is being given to other specific roles in response to board or regulatory changes, such as climate action specialties, social planning and project management. Another example comes from the Cumberland Landfill. And while it falls under the CSWM service, I think it's helpful to share with you today. 
Um, when engineered landfills are first commissioned, it's important that the first layer of garbage is soft and squishy so that the liner doesn't get punctured. By taking more time to arrange that first layer, more airspace in the cell can be realized. Also, compacting the waste in a more coordinated way can result in better use of the airspace. Uh, our experience was to provide an additional waste management operator during that cell commissioning and while the cell was filling, which resulted in a prolonged life for the landfill. Given the high costs of adding more engineered landfill space, the additional staffing costs in this instance are more than offset by the delay in spending more money to expand the landfill. To provide some insight to how we propose new positions and department structures, we've listed a few of our considerations here. Um, we work with the management team to review existing structure and whether changes are needed. Uh, we're looking at future workloads, potential for partnerships, skills in the market and within the organization, and trying to ensure that changes that are made are, are done so in a way that promotes stability. We also note on this slide that new positions and restructures occur because of four particular drivers. One is operational volumes that have increased, and that might be because, be because of growing population and the greater demand on services or related to the CBRD um, receiving the responsibility of improvement districts. Secondly, regulations, senior government established regulations and um, add expectations over time. Examples include regulations associated with environmental protection or social expectations, uh, adding complexity to the CBRD's role and at times requiring additional personnel or expertise. Thirdly, technical, technological change. Sometimes technology changes or evolves to a point where a position is identified and needed to continue delivering services and the technology improves how that service is delivered. An example is use of the use of SCADA. Many years ago in our water, sewer and rec facilities, valves had to be opened and closed by hand after a staff member had either sampled water, determined pressure levels or confirmed the amount of chemicals being used. Much of that work can now be done in an automated way by using sensors and specialized equipment that add chemicals or open valves when the conditions require. However, the installation of the monitoring equipment, the coding of software and systems refinements, all needed technologists to manage the SCADA systems. And over the past several years, the CBRD now includes positions in its permanent workforce that are data dedicated to the SCADA system. Other examples exist or will be contemplated over the coming years as technology continues to evolve. Lastly, fourthly, the new and expanded activities. So in response to board direction, uh, we may also propose positions to deliver on your interests. And that may relate to brand new services that undergo public approval or added expectations around working with community organizations or reporting on results that are beyond statutory requirements. When we present the proposed new positions for 2023, we'll link those positions to one or more of these drivers to better explain where the demands are coming from. Uh, lastly, I wanted to touch on a couple of trends that we're seeing in the human resources. Primarily, we're in an employee's market where recruits have multiple opportunities for career advancement. So what can we do about that? We can offer employment that is competitive, um, provides great benefits and flexibility. The COVID pandemic helped us realize that remote work is a possibility, and we're seeing more and more situations where it, it makes sense. That said, the Comox Valley is a great place to live and work, and the CBRD strives to offer a healthy work-life balance. And finally, I've mentioned previously that we are continuously looking at how better to deliver our services, and we're recognizing how important it is to work collaboratively. This means across the CBRD's branches, but also with our partners. So coming back to the key points I wanted to leave with you today, I, I hope that you can see um, that how important our people are to the delivery of core services, um, that the staffing plan, both the existing and new positions, is thorough, contemplates cross-department synergies, and balances operational requirements with emerging priorities and interests. And thirdly, the changes in staffing levels are driven by regulatory changes, added volume of work, new activities or services, and technological changes. Um, and with that, Madam Chair, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, James. We do have a question. Director Warren, go ahead. Great, thank you. Thanks so much for this report. It's nice to get a bit more detail <clears throat> on this department. We don't always hear about it. Um, I was curious whether we have, um, I'm sure we follow obviously best practice in hiring, but if we have a um, like an equitable hiring policy um, that's sort of a little bit more outside the box in terms of looking at how, um, where we recruit from, 
um, really looking at how we can diversify um, our staff um, and uh, looking at things like perhaps people don't have the credentials that we would normally put in a job description, but maybe they're a really good fit in other ways. And so do we offer, um, do we give opportunity with, pro, uh, you know, professional development if someone's at a different, in a different spot? I, I guess I, I, I mean, I, I've always loved the, uh, the success story with our water treatment plant and, and with the ability with some of those contracts to, to um, really set the bar high in terms of um, having under, you know, underrepresented folks working uh, more gender balance, all that kind of stuff. And I would love to see a, a really specific um, kind of policy around that. So if you could speak to that, that would be great. Thank yeah, you. certainly we can we can bring back information to the board that's specific to um, to the policy frameworks that we do have. Equity and diversity is is important um, for recruitment and and it is uh, embedded within our um, code of conduct and workplace respect policies. Um, all staff, not just in HR, are expected to undertake um, workshops and training around um, workplace diversity and, and workplace respect. Um, as to going beyond what we've often done in our, our recruitment, um, we're, we're constantly looking at opportunities to be able to expand that, that influence in that role. Um, some positions by nature of them, um, whether it be regulatory or, or higher level requirements, we, we must um, follow those requirements. I'm thinking about our water treatment plant and some of the very technical um, positions that require certification. Um, but in other instances, we're always looking for those opportunities that we can, we can expand and, and diversify the workforce. Just a quick follow up, um, and this is more about uh, salary, but I know many of us look at the Sophie report and uh, see those folks that are making the, whatever it is, whoops, 75,000 and above. Um, I'd love to see, you know, more diversity in, in, I mean, I think we do really great. We have a lot of, um, we have some balance, gender balance in our managerial or higher um, salary positions, but I think that's another another thing that we could, because um, those reports really do stand out often. Not not just here, but when you look at those reports, you can often see some real imbalances there. Um, so just just some feedback. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, alternate director Jellicoe. Thank you, chair. Um, and similar to director Moran's comments around. Um, inclusion and equity in our HR policies and practices at the regional district. Um, the city of Courtney is moving away from the, the term of chief uh, administrative officer uh, out of, again, an action towards our commitment of reconciliation and language being an important part around how we decolonize our spaces and, um, and um, this work of a, of a colonial government. I, I'd like to hear if there's been any thought around how the regional district is engaging in understanding. Um, I see on slide five and six, um, uh, restructuring and uh, partnership and collaboration are key drivers for restructuring and organizational assessments of where you are from an HR perspective. And I'd love to hear if um, the regional district has given any thought around the, the use of the word chief in some of the, its titles of its positions. The, um, I believe it was last year, the um, reconciliation and the the framework that the regional district has adopted for reconciliation does talk about reviewing all of our policies and all of our documentation to look to decolon decolonialize um, the, the policies and procedures and the language that we use. So um, we haven't specifically looked and taken a look at the, the word chief in some of our titles, but certainly that would be a component of, of some of that analysis. Um, and as for the, the restructure, we're, we're continually engaging with those branches and departments to understand those, those opportunities. Thank you. Um, I would just add one thing. The, the picture up there is the Emergency Operations Center. And one thing that was done with respect to our practices in the Emergency Operations Center was to remove chief. Chief is used as it was used as the terminology of those that are section heads. And uh, so we've definitely made the difference there. We are looking for our uh, 
the establishment of our working group or our collaboration with Indigenous peoples from throughout the community that will commence in, in December. And I think that will be the next steps to guide us and lead us as to what the most important steps are to change. And from my perspective, certainly I don't need that word in my title and I'd be glad to have something else. So, yeah. Thank you, Russell. I don't see any further lights. And that was it for that orientation. Okay. All in favor of receipt? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. How are we feeling? Do we need um, a bathroom break? Or do you want to keep going? Okay, keep going. That's what I'm hearing. Okay, so we're on item five, and that is the Comox LA Transit Management Advisory Committee minutes from September 15th. Moved by McCollum, seconded by Jolliker. Any conversation around those Transit Management Advisory Committee minutes? Hearing none, we're on receipt, all in favor? And that's carried, thank you. Next, we have the Comox Valley Sewage Commission minutes from September 20th. Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? And that's carried unanimously, thank you. And we're on to the parcel tax rule review panel from 2020, 2023. <laughs> Moved by Hillian, seconded by Grant, thank you. Pass it to staff. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Kevin Duval will introduce this uh, staff report and the recommendation that is provided. Oh, sorry, I do see that um, Director Arbor has his hand up. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead with the report in case it gets censored in there. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Kevin. Thanks. Thank you very much again through the chair to the director. So yeah, just a brief overview of this report. Uh, the parcel tax review panel is an annual process undertaken by the regional district. And what this does is uh, gives folks that are, are levied a parcel tax an opportunity uh, to bring forward any um, concerns or error missions that they may feel are part of that parcel tax role. So at this time every year, we do bring a report forward to requesting establishment of that parcel tax review panel. Um, by legislation, we are required to uh, identify at least three uh, directors to sit as part of this panel. Uh, but given we have the four uh, uh, electoral area directors, uh, we always recommend that uh, all four uh, area directors are part of that panel. So that would be our three uh, electoral area A, B, and C directors and also the area from Strathcona Regional District Area D, given the inclusion of the uh, Black Creek Oyster Bay service, specifically the water service. So really this just kind of outlines the, the uh, date uh, of which we've set for that, which is Feb February 22nd at 9.30 a.m. Um, and again, we will be then presenting those roles for the various parcel taxes within the services as identified in table one on page two. Uh, and then, you know, based on that process, we'll be kind of uh, authenticating and moving forward with that role. So that's really all I have, but certainly welcome any questions. Okay, Director Herbert, did, was your question answered? Nope, but it was all helpful though. Um, so just a couple of brief questions um, because I'm not sure we're gonna see that at ESC. We're probably just gonna go straight to the, the parcel tax roll uh, authentication. Um, and since we have the table there, um, one is just a comment. It, it feels like the Black Creek Oyster Bay Water Local Service Area, that seems like such an archaic uh, way to uh, measure contribution with a per foot frontage, as opposed to a parcel tax. Um, I'm, I'm trying to see the rationale if you have a really long and deep property, but you just have a, a narrow front. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know how it's calculated. So that's the question, whether, whether there's something that makes more sense. And then for area A, B and C parks and greenways, can you confirm whether that $19 is actually what Director Grieve has mentioned a few times, which is um, a contribution that goes straight towards um, acquisition fund for parks um, or whether there's another purpose? Because I know we pay a rate uh, other than the parcel tax. So I'm, I'm wondering if this is a redundant parcel tax when it could be absorbed into the overall rate or if there's a, a rationale why that parcel tax exists. Uh, 
through the chair to Director Arbor. So yeah, I can I can speak to both of those. I mean, with respect to the the frontage, uh, you're absolutely correct. Uh, that is an, an older model and 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 is actually our last frontage tax. Um, everything else has kind of switched over to that more traditional parcel tax model. So something we may look at uh, considering going forward and maybe in line to your second question regarding the parks and greenway service. So yeah, that $19 that's collected for that specific frontage or sorry, parcel tax is actually uh, gone into a, a specific reserve. I believe it's the land acquisition reserve. So, and that was established by, uh, I believe a, a, a policy of the board going back to, I want to say 2011 off the top of my head. Um, 2010, that was close. Um, so yeah, that's really kind of what drives that that annual contribution. Um, but also, you know, based on you know previous discussions at the electoral series table, uh, we will be undertaking a, a series of review of some of these parcel taxes, hopefully in 2023, and, and then potentially bringing recommendations back to to the directors at that time. Thanks so much, Kevin. Okay, I don't see any further lights. So all in favor of receipt. Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. And there is a recommendation. Moved by Grant, seconded by Jollyker. And the recommendation is that a parcel tax rule review panel be held at 9.30 a.m. on February 22nd, 2023, to authenticate the 2023 parcel and frontage tax rule. And that directors from Comox Valley Regional District Electoral Areas A, B, C, and Strathcona Regional District Electoral Area D, with respect to the Black Creek Oyster Bay Water Service Area, be appointed to the panel. Any further discussion? To vote the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. And we're on to item eight, which is next generation 9-11 local government agreement update. Moved by Greaves, seconded by McCollum. Thank you. Over to staff. Yeah, thanks. And Jake Martins will explain this uh, amendment and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Russell, and through the chair, I'll uh, keep my comments quite brief, given that this is our second time here to the board with respect to this agreement. Uh, as uh, for those of you that were uh, with this last term, this uh, agreement came to you in June, in which uh, it's part of a national initiative to uh, modernize our 911 service uh, to include precise location data, photo sharing, video calling, uh, connected vehicles, and other features uh, that will come with this. Currently, uh, we just have right now the analog system. And uh, as obscure it may sound, uh, we do require as part of this initiative for there to be an agreement between the end users, uh, which you represent as the local government, and TELUS, which is the telecom that's charged with actually providing the 911 service. So there's a whole bunch of agencies and uh, local governments and uh, service providers in between all of this, but basically the, the CVRD, uh, through your 911 function, which you operate, uh, serves as that uh, connection point into the 911 system. And so this is our... Um, connection here to this agreement. This agreement itself uh, has been man mandated by the CRTC, uh, which is, a, a, of course, a federal uh, organization. And uh, so there's not much room for negotiation on this. This agreement is being rolled out across uh, all local governments and First Nations across the country. Uh, but again, as it represents simply a replacement of the existing agreement and enables that new technology, we feel confident that we're uh, in the right place and this is the right agreement to take forward. Um, we're also proud to be kind of uh, uh, one of the um, uh, leaders in this regard and that in which our 911 uh, corporation is is uh, ready and able with the technology to implement this next generation uh, now. So we're eager to get this agreement in place. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'll leave it there and please answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Jake. Any questions? Okay, I don't see any. We're on receipt and it's above the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. There. Recommendation moved by Director Hillian, seconded by Director Grant. And it's that staff be authorized to execute the updated next generation 911 local government service agreement as attached as Appendix A. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. On to item nine UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund application. Moved by McCollum, seconded by Hillian. Thank you. Over to staff. Thank you very much. And um, Doug DeMarzo, General Manager of Community Services, is here to provide a brief summary of the intention of this application and answer any of your questions. 
Thank you. And through the chair, this is similar to grant streams we've had in the past, in particular, the hosting with humility grant we previously applied for. Um, the difference here is we're taking this as a larger northern approach led by the Strathcona Regional District to create and strengthen relationships. So you'll see 10 co-applicants here, uh, mostly north of us, including many First Nations. Um, this recognizes significant savings by working together as well as increasing our relationship building for a total grant ask of 254,000 of which the CVRD is requesting approximately 25,000. Activities include cultural safety and uh, looking at emergency management tools to be inclusive of Indigenous peoples. Uh, there's two recommendations here for your consideration. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you. I do see a question from Director Arbor. Go ahead. Yeah, when I was reading the report, it, it literally put a smile on my face when it came to the activities, uh, the proposed activities. They sound so awesome. Building bridges through understanding the village and paddling together workshops, sacred belonging, salvage, and restoration scale building workshops, pathways to recovery. I mean, it, it really seems really good. It's something <laughs> I'd love to partake in. So I'm glad to see such a broad potential support for an application like that. I do note um, on the intergovernmental, I guess we're just looking outside because it doesn't list, list the CVRD, but that's, I guess it's because it's our report. Is that is that the, the reason? Or I guess we would be listed as, as co-applicants in, uh, in the application as well. Yes, that's correct. It's just listing our other co-applicants would be together with these ones in the actual. Final yeah, thanks for putting this forward. It's awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, we're on receipt. It's a vote of the areas. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Recommendation. recommendation has been moved by Director Greve, seconded by Director Grant, and that is that uh, we approve the application and we support the application being submitted through on our behalf through Strathcona Regional District. Any further discussion? Okay, again, it's the vote of the areas. All in favor? And that's carried unanimously. Thank you. How are we doing? Keep going. Break. All right, we're going. Bylaws and resolutions for first and second reading. We're starting with bylaw 733, the Rural Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw. So moved. Uh, moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor. And it is for first and second, and it's a vote of the areas. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're moving to bylaws for adoption, and we have uh, bylaw 725, the Comox Valley Economic Development Service Conversion Bylaw. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Hillian. A vote of the full board for adoption. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. On to three, which is bylaw 734, visitor center fees and charges bylaw. Moved by Grant, seconded by McCollum. It's for adoption and voted for by the areas, Courtney and Cumberland. All in favor? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Director Shalika. Thanks, Chair. And um, it's not listed in the uh, Schedule A of what the actual amendment is. We're just, what, what I'm able to see is just on the go forward. So can staff speak to what the difference is between the existing, um, I, which I don't have the existing bylaw up um, and what we're voting on? It, yeah, so staff are saying it's not an amendment. The entire bylaw is being voted on and that is um, on the link that on your So it's not a agenda. change of fees. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's again, it's the vote of the areas, Courtney and Cumberland, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. We're on to new business, and there's a public hearing for bylaw number 733. Mm -hmm. Moved by Grant, seconded by Arbor. Thank you. 
Um, so new business is the date of the public hearing. Is that correct? Okay. So we'll oh, I, go ahead, Director Arbor. Yeah, I just find January 4th, like right after for many people, not for everybody, obviously, but for a lot of people, it's right after the holiday break and for families, the return to school and all that. So was there a specific rationale why we scheduled on that day? Alana says no, not specifically, but we do try and do these uh, as, you know, relatively as soon as possible around the availability of the facility and the people that must attend. We're already pouring concrete. <clears throat> Is it, uh, it's not my area, so I'll, I'll forgo my comment. <laughs> I think it's area B or ASC, so. Area C. <laughs> yeah, all right. If it runs okay with it, I'm good. Okay, and do we want to decide on the directors now before accepting receipt or within the resolution? Yeah, I think Edwin should chair it. That's my take. Yeah, and he could be the alternate as well. Yeah, <laughs> both alternates, yeah. Director Grieve and Director Grieve. No, we, we can do a director grieve and uh, unless uh, Director Hardy, I can put his name forward, but if he if he doesn't want to, uh, I can put my name in there as well. It's asking for both, isn't it? So Director Grieve as chair and Director Hardy and uh, Arbor as alternates because- that, that, that yeah. that. Yep. Done. There, there you go. <laughs> okay, so we're on receipt. All in favor of receipt? Any opposed? That's carried. Okay, you can move the recommendation. Second. Moved by Grant, seconded by Grieve. And uh, it's that the public hearing will be held on January 4th at 6 p.m. at um, the CVRD um, Civic Room, where we're sitting today. And there will be public input accepted through in submissions and verbal comments and that Director Grieve will be chair and directors Hardy and Arbor are designated first vice chair and second vice chair respectively. And at least one of the above named delegates must be in attendance at the public hearing. Okay, a vote of the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously, thank you. Uh, item two, City West request for a letter of support. Move we'll receipt. Moved by Hillian, seconded by McClung. Thank you. And over to staff. Thank you. And James Warren will provide an outline of the request that is made and the recommendation. You moved. I was <laughs> looking over there. <laughs> it's the shortest uh, video of microphone. <laughs> Um, thanks, Russell. This correspondence comes from City West, the, um, the organization that is looking to install high-speed internet in, um, in several areas on Vancouver Island and, and along the coast. They're also in partnership with the um, um, Connected Coast Initiative that the Strathcona Regional District and City West have embarked upon to provide high-speed internet um, all on the coast of British Columbia. So this request um, speaks specifically to um, some grant funding that may be available to an internet service provider for areas that are currently underserved. Um, City West is asking for a, a letter of support from the CBRD. There would be no um, uh, further obligation or consideration beyond this letter of support at this time. Okay, go ahead, Director Grieve. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair, Chair, Chair and the CAO. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, this, this is um, just basically landfall for the for the fiber optic they're not talking about providing service or anything but it makes an opportunity there for further grant funding possibly because then you'd have the spine right you'd have the the connect connect the coast fiber optic download at williams beach road that's my understanding my understanding is connected coast already has the funding and the plans in place for all of those um landfalls as you say so they are connected coast is already laying the submarine fiber and they are um connecting it to islands um gulf islands vancouver island and several places including williams beach 
this application is um, the last mile funded. This application would enable the, the internet service provider, in this case, City West, to, um, to proceed with last mile um, connectivity to the homes. Sounds like a good Christmas present. Thank you. And Director Arbor, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, and obviously that's our partner on the Hornby and Denman project and a quick update to the board. We've got fiber optic cables just about everywhere right now <laughs> lying in front of driveways and the install is proceeding at a mad pace, uh, which is really exciting. Um, I would I would like to propose um, that we go the step uh, beyond like we did on Hornby and Denman and that with the requested action that we uh, assign staff to have discussion about what uh, uh, potential um, um, beneficial arrangement um, around a project like that could look like. I'm sure that James knows exactly what I mean behind between the lines, but I'm trying to not be prescriptive. <laughs> but as, as the people know here, we have a very unique arrangement around the Hornby and Denman project, and it'd be pretty cool if that could be replicated in the Black Creek and Merville area. Um, the, the arrangement or the service that exists on Hornby and Denman, it's the culmination of, of several years of work by a local organization or, or community group on Hornby and Denman Island. Um, on the islands that, that investigated opportunities for connectivity, for um, who or what organization could be an internet service provider. So, so it was the culmination of several years of effort. Uh, in this instance, City West is, is asking for a letter of support because um, I, I understand it's because they see opportunity to proceed to directly to this grant opportunity and to proceed on their own as an internet service provider. They haven't asked for any additional um, consideration by the CVRD. Should the board want to um, direct staff to, to take a look at that? Certainly we can, um, but I, I do think there, the circumstances are, are different compared to Dem and Hornby and, uh, and this situation. Yeah, can I have a follow-up, uh, uh, Madam Chair? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I think James has a valid point, but um, another thing that happened in the last month is um, and the federal government has announced yet another 200 million for uh, last mile, which will help connect 60,000 homes. So I, I'm pretty sure that these homes are going to get connected one way or another. So there might be opportunity. But if if I think on balance, probably James is probably right, unless Director Grieve really wanted to go to bat on this one. But I just thought I'd provide that feedback. Thank you. Next, we have Director Kerr. Thank you. Just curious, is this a private company? And if so, are there any other companies that are offering to do similar work? I just, just want clarity on whether we're supporting one company over other potential bidders. So the um, City West is a, a municipally owned corporation. It, um, it operates through the city of Prince Rupert uh, and has expanded its services over many years to provide um, cable and internet services um, across much of the Northwest. And now they're in partnership with Strathcona Regional District for the Connected Coast Project. Um, that being said, the CVRD has been approached from time to time on other grant applications and, and it has considered um, providing those letters of support where there is, um, I think where there's broad public opportunity for, for service benefits and, and improvements to services. So in this case, City West is, is a municipally owned corporation. Usually it's the bigger telecom companies that we're approving letters of support for. Okay, any further questions? All right, we are on receipt. And it's a vote of the full board, all in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. There is a requested action. Okay. Moved by Grant, seconded by McCollum. And that is that we provide the letter of support to City West. Any further comments? Okay, a vote of the full board, all in favor? Any opposed, that's carried unanimously, thank you. Motion that the addendum be considered, moved by Hillian. Seconded by Grieve, thank you. All in favor? Any opposed, that's carried, thank you. And the addendum is the Electoral Area Service Committee, um, oh, Rural Community Grant. Moved by Helian, seconded by 
Grant and Grieve, go ahead. Just quickly speaking to this, um, the Black Creek uh, Bread of Life is is kind of like the the food bank for the northern part of the of the county here, and um, uh, about I guess it was 2020. We thought it was 2021, but 2020 they asked for uh, a small grant aid from our rural community grant fund for 5,500 bucks, and and this time they came back with another grant uh, request. That of course was caught up in the election and everything. So this had to be expedited. We only brought this through the Electoral Area Services Committee yesterday. And that's why it's addendum. But of course, timing is everything with Christmas coming up and everything. So um, this this year it's going to be ten thousand dollars. So I, I just uh, encourage support. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, Director Morin? Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just uh, just wanted to say uh, this sounds like good. Great thing to support, and I was curious whether um, this group has any uh, any reports or anything like that on who they're serving, how many people, and all that, and and also just if uh, Director Grieve has a connection and relationship with them, um, maybe plant the seed around uh, the Food Policy Council. Anyway, yeah. Do you have any information on numbers or anything like that? Thanks. It was it's it's in the request, but uh, we do um, require a report out that, uh, for these grants. Something that we we didn't do ten years ago. So yeah, that it'll it'll it's uh, probably um, probably forthcoming after 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 Christmas. We'll get an idea of where the money went. And I don't have a personal relationship with them. I don't just uh, just the second time they've approached us. Okay, Director Kerr, go ahead. Uh, just again, curious uh, my, for my own learning. Do we have a like? Where is this money coming from? Is it coming from a, uh, a specific grant and aid fund? Um, and is it typical for the CBRD to uh, like give funds to a like a private organization or a church in this case for these uh, for these types of programs? Yeah, the um, the electoral areas have a grant and aid program. So three separate programs for the electoral areas. Um, they receive applications and proposals that they usually vet all at the same time. They consider whether they collaborate on those or just go as individuals. This one just came late in the year and was an urgent request, and that's why it's being considered uh, because it just became forward to the ESC just this week. So, and this type of organization is not unusual. It basically, it's on you know providing community services and benefits to the electoral areas to the satisfaction of the area directors. And so, this was seen yesterday at the ASC meeting and discussed there, and coming to the the full board for approval. Director Jolicoeur. Yeah, and thank you, uh, Chair. I, I, I'm really happy to see this come forward. I, a question for staff through the Chair. Uh, when great opportunities like this come forward, and if, if this, the will of the body here, approves it today, um, is there a communication that goes out through um, the RD communication channels to inform the public that we're supporting organizations like this? Uh, we usually do when we do the major grants. This one would be at the discretion of the electoral area director. And if he wished, we would uh, provide something on social media to the, that extent, but we'd work with the area director on that. Yeah. Uh, director Green? Yeah, quite often the, the three electoral areas individually put out a quarterly newsletter. So this would be something you'd put in, in the quarterly newsletter. And Director Arbor? Yeah, thanks for the benefit of Director Kerr and, and Director Jolly Kerr, plus the, the old timers as well on the board. Um, and, and at Richard Hardy as well, at Director Hardy as well. But uh, um, it's it's quite a bit of money that gets put out through um, the electoral areas. It's called it's not got, called grant and aid, it's now called the rural uh, rural grants. And we have two streams. We have a stream for yearly application, but we also have a multi-year stream for qualifying organizations. Um, and there's actually more than three services. There's five because uh, Hornby and then men have their own as well. Uh, and there's one for the Bainstown portion, one for um, Area B, and one for ASC. 
and in order order of magnitude, um, you know, it's each of those services are anywhere from um, forty to one hundred fifty thousand, and that that gets put out put out each year, and that's in recognition that in rural areas, um, a lot of the uh, public service delivery comes through. Um, volunteer and nonprofit organization. Uh, we don't have the critical mass that the municipalities are. So in, in a lot of rural areas, it's really the community that carries a lot of the, the core functions often in partnership with the CVRD. So it's a form of acknowledgement. Then the other thing I'd like to comment on is the fact that everybody is voting on this when really, um, you know, the CVRD like Dr. Grieven or RDNI don't go and vote on Courtney decisions or Comox decisions around Benton 8. So this is unique to regional district. But yesterday at the ESC, we did pass a motion to review the delegated authority of the ESC partly in response to Director Grant's comment that too many things from ESC make it to the board. So I'm wondering if this would be one of those that could stay at the ESC um, rather than having everyone vote, but we'll get a report on that in the future that I'm sure we'll share with the board. Thank you. Great, thanks for that background. Director Hillian, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. Just a minor point. Uh, for all the reasons just discussed, I, I generally vote on these, but don't uh, comment on them because I see them as the business of the areas. Thanks. Thank you. And I don't see any further lights. So we are the recommendation on the um, floor is that of the um, Rural Community Grant Award of $10,000 to Black Creek bread of life food share in area C. And it is a vote of the full board. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And we will take a break and then move